I mean, it's just, you know, people are desperate and they're sick. Among Dr. Steer's early patients, Peter Rubel of Concord, one of the earliest cases of Lyme disease on record. He traces his illness back to a tick bite in 1959. Yes, it's getting on close to 50 years, 49 years, yeah. yeah. Undiagnosed for almost 30 years, Rubel was on daily IV antibiotic treatments when Chronicle interviewed him in 1990. I was the one of a group of 28 patients under Dr. Alan Steer that was part of a trial that proved that ceftriaxone, given two grams a day for 28 or 30 days, would do the job. Steer's study concluded that Lyme could be eradicated with a month's worth of antibiotics, findings adopted by the Infectious Disease Society of America, or IDSA. IDSA guidelines say patients who don't respond to a short course of antibiotics do not have Lyme, but something else. Chronic Lyme does not exist. But these doctors that I call some of them the early experts, because they were involved early, overcommitted themselves, and now they don't want to back off. Sam Donta believes chronic Lyme does exist, and he uses antibiotics as long as it takes to get his patients well. But the IDSA, of which Donta is a founding member, doesn't seem to want to hear about this successful treatment. I think the intransigence comes from premature conclusion. And now they've dug their heels in, and they don't want to back off. How embarrassing can it get to say, oh, I was wrong. As for Steer's patient, Peter Rubel, turns out the cure didn't take, after all. I felt better for a few months, and I thought uh, everything is fine, and then it turned out things weren't fine. All kinds of central nervous system vision problems, I've been blinded hundreds of times and so forth. I'm used to have, uh, oh, a certain amount of MS, I'm epileptic. Now, the IDSA's narrow guidelines for treating Lyme disease have drawn attention outside of medical circles. The, the guidelines have tremendous economic effect, which is the reason that an economic analysis and an antitrust investigation are appropriate. Richard Blumenthal, Attorney General of Connecticut, opened an investigation when he heard that thousands were being denied treatment or insurance coverage because of the restricted Lyme guidelines. His investigation revealed multiple undisclosed conflicts of interest among doctors on the IDSA panel. Some were on the payroll of insurance and drug companies. Others had financial interests in patent development. Furthermore, the panel excluded any doctor who didn't toe the party line, that there's no such thing as chronic Lyme disease. One of the individual members of the panel who disagreed or dissented was actually himself excluded and shown the door. The person kicked off the guidelines panel? Sam Donta. So I think this is a sad chapter for us. Our Infectious Disease Society made guidelines prematurely. I tried to warn them and say we're not ready for guidelines because we don't know what this is all about. Navigating the maze of the Lyme lands can be daunting. I really thought I was in a dream. I mean, it was really quite, um, you know, kind of unbelievable. I kept thinking we were going to wake up. A challenge even to those adept in the ways of the medical world. Sheila Statlander is a psychotherapist, her husband an orthopedic surgeon. When their oldest child fell ill, Doctors at Boston's top hospitals couldn't figure it out. One thing was certain, he couldn't have Lyme. The test showed it. If we feel naive anywhere, it's that we just kind of blindly accepted um, that these tests were reliable. Then their second child got sick, and finally Ari, their third. That's when Sheila Statlander realized they had to figure things out themselves. What we learned was, you know, frankly, very appalling. But now I was getting the information that those tests are unreliable. So that's when we realized that the kids had really never been appropriately evaluated. Like Pamela Weintraub, she found her way to Dr. Charles Ray Jones in New Haven. I believe that he saved my children. You go to school all day long? It's no coincidence that both families found their way to Dr. Jones 
Kay Lyon and her daughter as well. I don't believe in organized religion, but Dr. Jones is a saint. He is a living, breathing saint. You see, kids come here from all over the United States, indeed the world. Jones is the only pediatrician giving long-term antibiotic treatment to kids with Lyme. And that's brought him a world of trouble. How do you account for this resistance to your methods? Uh, that's, a, that's a very difficult one. I mean, some of it has to do with pride. They live in, a, in an academia and they have their clinics or where the end they see maybe three or four patients with Lyme a week. They don't have the experience where I see 14,000 children with Lyme disease over a period of years. Jones is 79 and works a minimum of six days a week, as seen in the provocative new film about chronic Lyme, Under Our Skin. He's also had to make time for multiple appearances before the Connecticut Medical Board to defend his unorthodox treatments. Jones is at pains to point out that all the children involved in these cases are doing well. Why haven't you caved in and just hung up your oh, shingle and retired? If I had retired and resigned, uh, I think it's five years ago, four and a half years ago, when they came with me with the statement of charges, if I had done that then, there'd have been 3,000 children who had been denied treatment, and they wouldn't have gotten it elsewhere, because a lot of people don't, they just don't treat kids. The number of confirmed cases of Lyme disease in Massachusetts has been steadily increasing. In spots, it's a full-out epidemic. My neighbor has um, probably been infected at least eight times. No kidding. No, and his cousin is sick with it, too. Susan Mercurio Street in Hamilton is crowded with the stories behind the statistics. The yellow house uh, down here, the woman had it. Across the street from her, the daughter was very sick with it. And the numbers don't begin to count those who have trouble getting diagnosed or suffer from co-infections. Ticks can carry a number of illnesses. But general practitioners can't be expected to know everything, says Pamela Weintraub, author of Cure Unknown, Inside the Lyme Epidemic. Doctors who will work in communities follow the guidelines because they're not experts, they're not, they're not researchers, they're, they are, and, and they are tied to HMOs, which of course also subscribe to this very cookie-cutter form of medicine. And resistance to the notion of chronic Lyme can coexist with compassion. This is not just a group of wackos that is looking for attention. Jonathan Edlow is author of Bullseye, unraveling the medical mystery of Lyme disease. And I've interviewed a lot of people for the book, and I must say that, that uh, many of those individuals, or at least some of those individuals, struck me as, as very reasonable people and very psychologically intact, who had had well-described Lyme disease and then was never the same after that. Still, without hard evidence of living Lyme bacteria in such patients, Edlow is reluctant to acknowledge that the infection persists in some undetectable state. As a scientist, most of the evidence favors the mainstream view on this. That, of course, can be hard to hear for the many who do not respond to the standard 30-day treatment. Mainstream science shows that about 20% of the people um, who are diagnosed later than a year fail the treatment and just stay sick. And that's an epidemic that's created by those very narrow and restrictive uh, guidelines. And they can spend years wandering the wilderness of contested disease.